Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 73, our top 100 games, part 2. We're back! Indeed, we are back talking about my favorite games. I don't know why I see our. This is only my list, uh, with no input from anyone else, but uh, my top 100 games as of right now, or a couple weeks ago when I made this list, although I don't know if much would change since then. But as of right now, these are my favorite games. We did the first 34 last week, or 100 through 67, or last podcast. This podcast, we're going to go all the way up through number 34. This section, this middle third of the list, actually has the most new games. Well over half of them are new to the top 100 list compared to the one I did two years ago. And I think there are a lot of really, really good selections here. Games that I've played since then are not necessarily new. In fact, I don't know if any of them are actually new. There are actually some quite old games on here. Quite old. Now that I'm looking at it, I see one game, two, we'll say two games, two-ish games that are actually, I would call, relatively new. But the rest are scattered throughout gaming history. New as um, in since the new last time we made the list. as in like published since published since the last time we made the list. Maybe okay. three, two to four, maybe okay. uh, if I remember. Yeah, probably two to four of these games. The rest were published before 2018, but they were new to the list for me, uh, either because I just got around to playing them or because they. I played them and they warranted moving up on the list or up into the list rather. So that should be fun. Again, well, well over half of these are new, a lot of them. So we have a lot to talk about. Let's start with the first one. Number 66 on the overall top 100, our second coin game on the list, Liberty or Death. We talked last time about A Distant Plane, which I argue is like the prototypical good coin game. I think if you're going to start with a coin and don't really have a preference one way or another on the actual historical period, then I would suggest a distant plane. Liberty or Death is, I think, one of the quirkier coin games. Uh, it's very much the opposite of a distant plane in that regard. Like, one player doesn't even start, like, one of the factions doesn't even start really playing the game. They're off the board. Yeah, uh, you have to, like, declare independence before the French even join. Yeah, so the French are just kind of chilling. They can lend some, like, monetary support, uh, but they don't come till what a quarter of the way through a third of the way through the game maybe yeah something like that um the other factions act fairly similarly to other ones but there's interesting like water rules in terms of like blockading um and navigating the eastern coast of the u.s i like how the native american faction worked uh, kind of raiding doing raids and such and being kind of wily and hard to to take out they were much. They're very much the neutral faction, like fighting yeah. for no one else to win, um, fighting towards neutrality, basically. But uh, I thought this was a really fun one. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, and that's why it's on my list. What did you think of Liberty or Death? Because we played it, we played it like twice in a row. I think. Yeah, I'm surprised this is higher than A Distant Plane. Um, I think it was good, and there were a lot of cool. Parts of it with how it incorporated the whole naval game and the different sorts of axes you're competing on. But I feel like two of the three games we played ended up in a weird reverse incentive situation where two of the players simply could not win and were trying to get their side to lose to get the casualties back close enough so that they could win on the other victory condition. And I, I just remember that really throwing the balance off and that falling behind in casualties early, like completely ruined the four player dynamic because it just upended everyone's incentives. Yeah, I don't remember that being an issue. I don't know. I think I just liked how odd it was, how much of an oddball of a game it is compared to some of the other coin games. And uh, that endeared itself with me. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really why why I put it up there. I mean, I think I gave it the same overall like numerical rating as a distant plane, but it it snuck up above it. Yeah, I think just because it's a little bit quirkier and I don't know, I had fond memories of it, even if it ended strangely. Uh, I had fond memories trying to figure out the different factions. That's fair. I just I would have put it a half step below 
a distant plane and the other top coin games that we've played. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that, that makes sense. Number 65, basically staying in the same relative spot as before, is Fog of Love, uh, which actually I want to get around to playing again. I, I've got ideas for how I want to do my review of this game, because it's so unusual and interesting, uh, but I, I want to play it a couple more times. Uh, but I haven't actually played it in, in quite a while, but it stayed uh, fondly in my memories. Same with number 64, Mysterium. Uh, one of my favorite party games. Although, I mean, maybe a bit heavy for a party game. We'll say pseudo party game. Uh, it's a it's a pretty classic party game, and I found you can play this with almost anyone. Almost anyone. The... So your mom hated it. No, she liked it. She just doesn't think in abstract okay. surrealist art. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she thought it was a cool game. She just you know didn't doesn't think that way. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, they, you, you're. It's one of those games where you're going to have some people uh, who don't like it so much because it is dealing abstractly with emotions and kind of not direct thinking. Um, but I love it quite a bit, and that's why it's still on my list. Number 63, another new game to the list, but an older game from the 90s, I believe. This is the little auction game for sale that I fell in love with. Uh, I heard about it. I've heard about it forever. I've heard it, everyone saying it's great. And then finally, we had like an hour at one of the PAXs, maybe the last PAX Unplugged we attended. Maybe, I can't remember. And I saw it on the table. I'm like, oh, I've always wanted to play that. And I know it's short, so I'll pick it up and immediately fell in love. I think it blends two different styles of auctions together super well, really fast to play. Is this the one where you bid on the offering of properties and then you... What's it? Closed bid those in to get money. Or yes. Something? So it's two bids. You you do kind of um, normal. Can't remember what what the bids are called, but you know, au normal auctioning au of, auction style where you auction raise or style pass. you raise or pass. Yeah. Uh, to get properties and then you sell them in a simultaneous closed auction. Uh, so it combines two different auction mechanisms. Uh, you're trying to get the most money on your sale, so you want to get valuable houses in the initial one because they're going to do better in the sale, but you don't want to spend too much money. There's lots of little fun considerations there about trying to outguess your opponents and such. A really, really fun, uh, what you might call filler game that holds up as one of the best I've played, even though it's over 20 years old, I believe. Yeah, it's fine. We played <laughs> it a bunch online during COVID because um, it's on Board Game Arena, I think. And eh, it's fine. Don't listen to Orion. It's fantastic. It's good if it. you like auction games as much as Mark does. That's true. I do like auctions quite a bit. Speaking of auctions, number 62, uh, moving down actually a decent amount on the kind of relative list, the net list compared to last time. I forgot I should mention this in case you didn't listen to the last podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm comparing this list to my list from two years ago. Uh, both in how far up or down games moved in total, and also how far up or down they moved compared to the other games that were on the list. So in other words, uh, subtracting out all the new inclusions to the list above it, how far did it move up or down? This one moved actually 11 spots down net compared to the games it was up against last time. Um, and I think just because I found that there are a couple weaknesses in the gameplay... That don't ruin the enjoyment, but make it so that I would only want to play really with like new people or all experienced people. And that's down for us. And the problem I encountered is that if you play down force with people who kind of know what they're doing, they tend to fall into this groupthink trap where they all bid on the car that's clearly winning the race. And if you all bid on the car that's clearly winning the race, you just give the win to the owner of that car. Like, in order to not give them the win, you have to try to spoil it with a different car. And that kind of bugged me. So I think that might be the reason why it moved down a, a smidge. But it's still a really fun game. I actually introduced it to my mom, who's visiting, just last week, and she really liked it. Super fun to look at. Uh, I wish the expansion had a bit more material. I, I played it online. I don't own it yet. But the expansion adds a couple new maps, it's fun, but it, it wasn't as 
I wish it was one of those expansions that's like, okay, you like this game, let's really dig into more mechanisms and more depth into the gameplay, but it just kind of adds a, a couple new maps and a couple powers. Um, but do you do you like Downforce? I forget it, Ryan. Yeah, no, I like it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Good light family game. Um, I just got annoyed playing online with that groupthink problem, and it's like, come on, people, you can't... If you all vote on the same car, you're just giving it to the winner, the owner of that car. Drives me nuts. Next on the list, new to the list, number 61, Decrypto. The little alternative, uh, in my mind, is is like Codename's slightly weirder cousin. And spoiler alert, I still don't like it as much as Codename's, but I did have quite a bit of fun with it. It is... It takes a while to get going in it, because you need to spend like the first third of the game gathering data. And then the middle chunk of the game is really interesting as you're all trying to puzzle through these clues and figure out the common, like the common connecting point between all these clues that are matching to a a specific term and figure out what that word might be. And it creates some really interesting uh, and fun moments when someone's like, Oh, I figured out the connected connective link here that's connecting all of these clues. Is uh, this the one with the number clues? Yeah. Where you have to guess them in order. I think this is the one you didn't like. Oh, I really didn't like this one. I thought it was well below and worse than Codenames or any of the other top clue-giving games like this. I thought the clue-giving was somewhat interesting and every other position or any other position was just really not fun. Yeah, it takes a while. You really got to dig into, you really want to dig into the solving of what your opponent's words actually are. And that aspect is fun, but it's also very time consuming, even more than code names. It's like a party game in disguise when it's actually this like word puzzle game that you could spend a lot of time with. Um, I also find it tends to be a bit difficult to explain to people. So it's, in terms of like a game you can bring out in any group, I don't think it's as accessible in that way as code names. Uh, there's just a few more little weird hinks in it that takes us some time for people to understand before understanding the game and like the, the way the incentives work and such. So I, while I do don't think it's as good as code names, I did enjoy it quite a bit when we played it a number of times in a row. And that's why it's 61. Number 60 is actually, of the returning games, it is tied for first with two other games for how far it moved up the list in net compared to the other games it was up against uh, on the 2018 list because it moved up 31 spots, five total spots. So this was ranked 65 last year, and that is London second edition from Martin Wallace. Really? Yeah. I uh, I don't know why. Like I, I I wasn't. I did not look at the list at all. Like the, I didn't look at the 2018 list at all. Obviously, my ratings of the games persisted. Um, you know, without with relatively little change. But this one just happened to move up a lot. And I think it's just because it's an enjoyable, like middle weight, middle length game, and those are sometimes hard to find. That it's like a 60 to 90 minute game relatively easy to learn and it has a very strong interesting puzzle the core puzzle being how wide are you going to make this tableau because the wider you make the tableau the more actions you can activate when you trigger like this giant cascading domino effect of actions yeah your your, um, your, your turns are basically draw cards play cards into your tableau or activate your entire tableau or quote unquote run your city yeah and Obviously, the more cards you have face up in your tableau, the more actions you get when you run your city, but the more upkeep you take, which turns into, what, poverty it's called? Poverty, yes. Yeah, and because then you're, that's uh, negative a bunch of victory points. You're like an end. 18th century miser in London, yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> buying property and such. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. The thematic connection is kind of weak. I I enjoy the like small thematic things. It's very like Dickens-ish of like... Dickensian, yeah. Dickensian? Is that's that, what the, that's okay. what the word is, yeah. Uh, but it's like, you know, having prisons and sewers gets rid of the poverty or something, which is, you know, maybe terrible if you say it like that, but it's funny in that context, at least to me. 
yeah, no, it has some humor in its uh, snobbishness there. But the, the, the fundamental question of how wide do you make your city uh, and how can you handle all these poverty tokens, how can you avoid loans, uh, it, it, I enjoy it quite a bit. It's got enough variety in the cards, I think, uh, that you kind of know what's coming up, but uh, there's still variety in the cards um, to pursue different strategies and go for different things. I think it's a really neat game. And I haven't played the first edition. I know some people really like the first edition better. I would I would find it interesting to give it a shot. I know it was changed up quite a bit. I think, but I believe the first edition has a map and everything. But this is London's second edition, number 60. Number 59 is my favorite dexterity game of recent memory, and that is Catch the Moon. The ladder stacking, connecting game where you create this kind of delicate structure of little wooden ladders floating above a cloud. It looks amazing. It has those great classic dexterity game moments of tension as someone is delicately trying to place their ladder and not make stuff fall over. Uh, Really clean, fun to play. We've had a blast with it. Yeah, this one is not really my style of game, but it is a lot of fun and it's always a good time when we bring it out. Plus, we all get to shout the moon weeps when you knock over the tower. Yeah, because if you mess up, the moon cries and you have to hold its tear. Yeah. Uh, which is, I mean, what could be more evocative than that? Really enjoying Catch the Moon. You want a dexterity game uh, a la Jenga or something like that? This is definitely one I would recommend. Uh, Better than Jenga for sure. I mean, Jenga's not... The problem with Jenga is that it's a pain to set up. That's the only problem with Jenga. Like, the actual, like, the, the gameplay itself is quite fun. Getting all the blocks together and getting it to stack and everything is just annoying. Uh, it's not as bad as you make it sound. Really? I mean, I, it's been a long time. I, the problem with Jenga is that when you play with six people, it comes down to two people going back and forth. Because once one person makes a move, the next two can just kind of grab the the two things under the layer they just created at the top and put them on top. Oh. And so then it goes back and forth between you know every three people... If you have a multiple of three, um, just because of each layer's three blocks. Um, yeah, yeah. But other than that kind of edge case or particular situ- situation, it's a fun. It's far know. deeper analysis into Jenga than I've ever heard. I just have a very <laughs> vivid memory of playing Jenga with six people one night. And it was me and Ashley going back and forth, and I would make a move, and then two people would be like, oh, simple, I, do, I don't have to do anything. And then she would make a move, and then two other people were like, ah, oh, great, now I have an easy move. And then eventually I lost, so that's, you know, why it's stuck in my Wow, mind. some old bitter Jenga wounds. Sure, we'll go with that. <laughs> anyway, 59's not Jenga, it's Catch the Moon. <laughs> 58, also new to the list, Innovation, which I think I had played back when I made the previous list in 2018, but did not like it first. It took me a couple games to really figure out what this was about. Was and this a 2019 game then for you? That when you, like, when it came into its own for you? Maybe. Um, or in late 2018? Because I feel like we haven't played it in well over a year. I um, played it a couple times. I played it okay. at a convention. Um, actually one of our patrons um i've enjoyed this game it's uh it's interesting it changes it up but it's a game that you can kind of learn how the different sorts of the different sorts of cards show up and you could potentially make more than immediate greedy decision making yeah it's a carl chuddick game so you know it's wild and crazy but this one seems more the most there's more back and forth. There's, and there's more back and forth. There's different strategies. And this is specifically as a two-player game. I have not played it with more than two players, but by all accounts, it's not nearly as good. And I can see that being the case. It's a tight game in which each turn you can take very wild swings, but it all seems to rotate back. If you know what you're doing and play well, it rotates back to the, a kind of tight game. Um, and each turn is such an endless... Like, like each time you draw cards, they're just endless possibilities, and it's just about figuring out how to utilize those possibilities in, in very creative ways. Yeah, and you can definitely break the game. Like, you can find combos that just break the game, 
Um, but the play tends to be very much a dynamic balance of trying to advance your position while blocking your opponent and watching out for what they might do and not playing into it too much. Yeah, really, really good game. Innovation. 57, another new one to the list. Although, man, I thought I'd played this before before 2018. Maybe I had it ranked lower. I don't know. Pictomania, the party really? game from Vladik like Vottle. We've had this for several years, at least. I, I think it didn't Maybe. make the list. Well, you were wrong. <laughs> I was wrong, because, I mean, I and I know I've grown to like it more and more the more I play it. It's really fantastic party game. It's simultaneous Pictionary. I love teaching it to new players and watching them grow confused and worried as the more <laughs> obtuse, yeah. bizarre clue <laughs> sets like come out. The shared angst as you reveal, like, the orange and red cards is glorious. Yeah. I think last time we introduced people, someone was like, "What's it? like?" Someone was actually concerned that that we pulled like some like badly designed clue cards, and we're like, "No, they're all like this. Yeah, they're all weird sets of similar strange the things." Only, the only downside is when it's a set of things where one person or two people are just completely unaware of that genre. Yeah, I guess, um, like, I think a lot in either the yellow or the orange, it's a lot of, like, book references and pop culture references. Specific, like... Like characters from Harry Potter. Yeah, there'll be one about a bunch of characters from Harry Potter or a bunch of different Disney princesses or a bunch of different um, Lord of the Rings references or, you know, like, 80s video games or, like, yeah. things like that where... And sometimes you just draw a new card, um, but yeah. Yeah, that's it's fine. A great time. But anyway, it, I mean, it's really, really well done. Just a wonderful, wonderful party game. So much fun. Maybe, I mean, I already said Codenames was higher, but other than that, this may be the highest party game on my list. I think it's our go-to. Depending, on, games. depending on your definition of party game. Number 56, also new to the list, Great Western Trail. Kind of Euro game we've been playing a few more times recently. Figuring out, we actually learned how to play it correctly, yep. uh, which helped. It's definitely better when you play it correctly. Yeah, Can't don't confirm. don't mess up the rules. Um, very interesting game. A lot of different kind of strategy paths you can go. Yeah, I'm, I, I think of it as a strategic... Actually, I, I tweeted about this last time we played. I think it really, more than most Euro games, balances strategic and tactical decision-making a lot in that there are distinct strategies to pursue, but if you also just want to grind out the minute, like, oh man, what's the word I'm thinking of? The, the marginal advantage every time, you can do that, but if you just want to like pick a strategy and go for it, that's also really fun. Yeah. Uh, it looks good, except for the cover, uh, which is abysmal. <laughs> um, but the, the game itself looks nice. Yep. And it's got all these like intermediary goals to go for. So it's like, oh, man, I want to upgrade my cows, or I want to hit this certain spot uh, when I reach Kansas City, or wherever the end point is, or I want to build this particular building, so you work up for that. There's all kinds of, like, tasty, fun options to choose from, even if you're still trying to just explore the game, and I think that's what I'm enjoying a lot about it. Yep, it's a good one for sure. Yep, number 55, the probably not available in the U.S. roll and write game Let's Make a Bus Route, although someone's got to pick up this game for printing in the U.S. Maybe someone has. I don't keep up with board game news that much. But if I see it on sale, I'm going to get a copy because this is a fantastic roll and write game uh, where you're all drawing bus routes on a central board, trying not to overlap with each other, trying to accomplish specific objectives, trying to pick up people and drop them off in the correct place. Oh, it was so good, so fun. I, I know I've talked about it before on this podcast, but I played it at a convention um, and immediately the me and the random group of people I decided to join their game all just kind of looked at each other and like, should we just play this again? And we're like, yes, let's play it again. Uh, so we got the rare double two times in a row play on the convention floor instead of trying something new. And that's how good it was. It was really fun. I, I, I want to introduce back to back the back to back. I mean, it's not a long game, but still, I mean, it's not, 
it was 45 minutes maybe um but it, it was that good it was really really good 54 also a game we played at a convention finally i've been wanting to play this one forever and the reprint allowed us to do so and that is dune the board game what a magnificent oh, cinematic experience i mean this is probably the closest thing to ti that we found in a different way but just the sort of big multiplayer the, the shifting storytelling of it. and the yeah. storytelling and the ebbs and flows and um, yeah yeah in that it's very diplomatic i i think yeah. i agree with you there um, all the actions are much simpler and the resources are simpler uh, and it's not quite as long it took it's, us it's not what, five hours yeah but we finished and in we like, were half of us was first time playing yeah but we also finished in like what turn four of ten or something of ten? Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, anyways. Maybe, maybe five. I, I, they, I We won, were not so. more than halfway through the nut total number of rounds. Fair. We were playing quite uh, We weren't playing slow. fast, though. We were yeah. not playing fast. Well, I think that's because we all knew like the game was... And after a while, we knew the game was pretty close to being over. We also were just... We were there to experience it because I think few of us had played it more than once ever and it's kind of that one of those bucket list games for a bunch of people at yeah, least yeah. at that table and we hadn't really played games before so it was just it was a great time i had just recently read the book at that time so also a lot the of that book was is fresh fan- also the book is fantastic. my memory can't wait for the yeah. movie whenever that's going to come out oh i hope it lives up to the book five years or whatever <laughs> uh, i hope the movie's good honestly i didn't love the book but i the the Dune board game is my favorite Dune property so far. <laughs> of all the Dune-related things, sure, uh, I, I enjoyed the board game far more than the book. Because uh, the book, I mean, people talk about how it's this massive, expansive world with all this political intrigue and factions, but that's like 10% of the book. Like, most of the book is about the one kid in his, like, weird hero savior's journey. Um, and it just kind of hints and pokes and prods at a lot of the the wider world and all the stuff that explores the wider world like this board game which is ostensibly about the book for, but from a far different perspective uh, I find much more interesting than the story of Paul in the book but that's just me don't hate on me I Dune did, is great I did get, like the book next time you get six people together for an all day game get play Dune yeah it's great this one could rise on the list for sure if I play more or fall if we it find that it does need exactly six, though. Oh yeah, you probably want to play with exactly six. I don't think it's strictly required, but it would probably not do as well. Yeah, probably. Probably. Uh, but I'm really glad I got that reprint, uh, or else I might have never played it. Fifty three, moving up twenty one net spots on the list from last year, up one total spot. I have no clue why it moved up that much, but that's just how the rankings came out. Captain Sonar. I guess this is kind of a party game. I don't know. It depends on your definition of party game. It's a group game. It's um, a group game. It's a little yeah, bit less party game. than some of the other ones we called party games. It's a party game for us, I suppose. Um, but Although, super, super fun. I have played this with my grandparents, um, so it's not un- unaccessible. Yeah, as I wrote in my review, it actually it takes something which is that some of the roles in the team game, in this game as a team game, are much simpler and easier to do than the other roles. And I think that's actually to its advantage, even though that's kind of a weird thing. Um, because you can just put the newer people in those spaces and not uh, melt their brains too much. Yeah, you need someone who is willing to dive in or confident to play the captain. And every other role can be filled with anyone who's willing to pay attention. Yeah. Um, but really fun. I, I wish, man. The, I wish we had I it wish here. we could. <laughs> I wish there wasn't a pandemic. We could play this again. Yeah. I do miss Captain Sonar. Uh, and we never, I don't think we ever played with the expansion. Matt bought the expansion and then uh, we didn't play and then the pandemic hit. Oh, uh, was the expansion extra maps? or It was extra it was. maps and challenges and such. Okay. Um, it looked quite good. It, it looked actually pretty robust. I want to play the map with the ice where you can only come up in certain spots. That's super cool. That would be fun. Yeah. Anyway, Captain Sonar number 53. 
Moving up, number 52, another new game to the list. My favorite game from PAX Unplugged two years ago. I guess December 2018, I believe. Tiny Towns, um, which I predicted publicly would be successful, and I think it has been. Kind of like halfway between family weight and mid-weight kind of Euro-y game uh, about building a tiny town by using Tetris-style constructions to build buildings which uh, fill up your space and give you points and rewards and you want different adjacencies and all that good stuff. But it's just fun to do. It's fun to build your little town. It's, It's simultaneous play, more or less. It's fun to, in advanced... Uh, with advanced groups, try to predict what your opponent, what resources your opponents want, and then call out anything other than that resource and have them get angry at you. It's got a, it's got something for everyone. Or just predict what they're going to call so that you can use those colors. Yeah, yeah. It's it's fun. It's fun. It's fun to look at. I really I, enjoy Tiny Towns. I think if you're a little bit less competitive, you could play this with most groups. Yeah, but I think it also works if you're competitive. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I just think it, it can scale up and down. Uh, with experience and competitiveness pretty well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really nicely done. I, I was supposed to get a review copy of the expansion, but it then the pandemic hit, and I think stuff got screwed up. Uh, but someday I'll get my hands on the expansion. I'm curious how they're expanding the game, because I think they could go many different directions with the Tiny Towns expansion. Number 51, the oldest game on my list, by a large margin, Go! Brand new to the list. Okay, I was going to say, I, Dune is pretty old within the realm of board games. But yeah, yeah, this Go's is, got it by a few know, thousand years. This is on a different time scale. So. <laughs> yeah, different time frame. Uh, Go, I mean, I'm terrible at it. I'm really bad. I literally don't think I have won a, a game yet. Even against all the people we were playing with, all of our friend group at a while, that started up the game learning it roughly at the same time, I think I never won <laughs> But, man, I respect it. I respect it a lot. I think oh, it's brilliant. it's so deep. It could easily become, like, an obsession where it's the only game I play for the rest of my life. Like, it's that kind of game. So deep and interesting. Um, I do enjoy chess. I've enjoyed watching chess videos. But Go has that extra layer of, like, mystique to it that draws me in as something, like, impenetrable. Like, I don't know how, what to do or how to do things. And that just makes it so much more interesting. It's like, I'm, I have this like love hate relationship with the game where I think it's brilliant. I think it's just so interesting. But when I sit down to play it, it's just like, I'm, I, I'm trying to learn a new language. Yeah. I find that so often I'll make a move maybe intuitively and not understand it until a couple moves later. And then it'll be like, Whoa, that's what's going to happen over here in this shape. Um, yeah, I also totally get how someone could study this game for their entire life and get philosophical revelations from playing it. Yeah, even though I'm nowhere near that level, I just I have seen it only enough to know that there's infinitely more that I could explore in this game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's and you just, think a game that's just about like placing one piece. It's so no special. Pieces. All you do is place a colored rock at an intersection. Yeah, and you just go back and forth doing that. It's just dots and grids, like yeah, just that. And I don't think I think you can play it forever and never get tired of it. It's it's an astounding game, um, truly astounding. That's and it's number fifty one. Number fifty, also new to the list. I think barely missing the last list. I'm pretty sure it, by a matter of weeks or a couple of months, maybe barely missing the last list. Cause I feel like I played this quite a while ago. The next 18 XX game on my list, number 50, 1822 CA, the Canadian mega, oh, yeah. mega narrative 18 XX game takes all day. Mm-hmm. So many auctions, so many private, so many small companies. It's, Oh, it's like the biggest, Playland of 18xx goodness across the entire country of Canada. Yeah, it's got uh, with that, some of the middle condensed. It's got that <laughs> epic storytelling. See how railways developed throughout the history of Canada experience factor that you love in games. Oh, I love the scale of it. I mean, I know other 18xx games are, you know, maybe 
you know, certainly quicker to play and more interesting on a really like tight cutthroat level. But I love just the, the almost sandboxy nature of this one. You're constantly bidding on cool abilities and you feel like you really have ownership of a company and you're trying to do great things with it as, you know, just like a, a very operational 18xx. I, I think it's a fantastic experience. Um, it, and it's probably because it's not really like other 18xx games that I've played at least. Yeah, it's one that you'll tell stories about afterwards. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, also, keep the peg weird. Keep the peg weird. Shout out to anyone who knows. Who's Shout either, out to the four people who know what we're talking about. Who know about. that joke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> number 49, basically staying in about the same place as it was last time, Seven Wonders Duel, which I saw actually just got a board game arena implementation. So I might go dig into this one online. I think we played this once at a convention and then never again. And I've it played it a handful of times. I've, I think I've only played it the once, and it was definitely interesting, but we just never went back to it. Yeah, we should play this on Board Game Arena. I would love to dig into this one, see if it holds up on over the online gauntlet. Maybe it'll be different on Next List, but about the same as it was before. Number 48, another relatively old game. I believe this one's from the year 2000, maybe? Battle Line from Reiner Knizia. More proof that Reiner Knizia is a genius. Um, is this the poker hand numbers one? Yes, it is that one. Okay. Yes, on the columns, on like the columns. like air, land, and sea, but yeah, a bit more simple. And there's more. Col- there's like what seven columns, and you have to win four of them, or like three in a row. Um, yeah, yeah, and you're trying to get the straights or the sets, and then you're you're basically building up a poker hand on your side of each of maybe seven or nine columns. It's seven. I'm pretty seven. sure. And well, no, it could be nine. I think if you, the goal is to have a winning hand on the majority of them, or if you get three consecutive that you win, um, that that's that's also a win. And then there's rules about like conceding, and there's rules about is there like the tactics card that lets you change the rules, tweak the rules slightly? Yeah, the battle line specifically. So it has like two versions. Battle line is GMT's printing. Uh, I can't remember the other publisher has Shot and Totten, which doesn't have those extra rule changing cards. Okay. And is also like one fewer. Oh, it also suit added one or more something, number. Or it one more made, number. Made it one to ten instead like of one to nine. Maybe? Just enough to be legally distinct. <laughs> uh, but they're basically the same game. I just put Battle Line because that's the copy I had. The GMT just did Battle Line Medieval, which is just themed. Just different art. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the original battle line was ancient or uh, ancient uh, armies on the art, uh, but it's hard to describe why this game is so good. But it's simultaneously like a quick playing game, and also one that has very complex logic strings. A game where you're going to be counting cards like on your second play because counting cards is so important to the game. Yep. You can actually, you can. You can like tactically win a certain column by dedu- by deducing that your opponent literally can't beat the grouping you have there. Mm-hmm. Uh, all kinds of good stuff like that. Uh, but it manages to also be very accessible as well. It's a very strange combination. It's got that Reiner Knizia elegance to it. Um, just a just a really nice game. I'm not convinced. I love. The extra deck that the GM, that battle line has that changes stuff up, that can change stuff up pretty substantially. I might prefer the more pure game, but I need to, I need to play with it more and experiment, experiment with it more. Yeah, I think some of the extra cards definitely were interesting and gave you alternatives to just being strictly blocked um, by not getting the right cards. Yeah, it mitigates but... some of the luck of the draw. But you had to give up taking cards to get those or something like that? Yeah, but you can't take two more than your opponent, so you could effectively block them by... You can't have too many, yeah. Because if your opponent takes one, if you never take another one, they can't take one either. So you could effectively shut them down. I don't know. I gotta play with it more. It's definitely one I would like to play more. 
Number 47 is new to the list, although certainly I had played it before 2018, and it's new because I've been playing a lot online the last couple of years, Magic the Gathering, oh, which yeah. I am greatly loving the arena implementation. I try to pop on, get my gold nearly every day, play out. We've gotten some, as we've mentioned before here on the podcast, I love draft most of all, and there have been some really good draft sets the last couple of years. I'm not in love with the current one. I think it's all right, but there have been some really, really good highlights. Throne of Eldraine was, in particular, was fantastic. Just a great fun uh, drafting, and that's pretty much how I play. Uh, to get gold and standard, I just net deck and <laughs> figure out what the best deck is and play those. But, yeah, uh, magic's fun. I enjoy doing a sealed draft every once in a while, but I just, I don't know. I don't love magic th- enough to really get into it, and I'm not willing to spend money on paper cards um, to be competitive. So yeah, I just think the draft, like drafting itself, is is the funny. If if it wasn't for draft, magic would not even come close to my top 100 for sure. Um, I think on standard it gets a bit dull. Some metas are more fun than others, but it's just kind of a grind. Draft is like all kinds of infinite possibilities as you're playing it out. I, I love draft. Number 46, staying in roughly the same spot as it was last list, is Vital Lacerda's The Gallerist. Not the last Vital Lacerda game that will be on the list, I'll tell you that much. And 45 is another coin game. This one is Falling Sky. It was also on the list last installment. I feel and like this the has next been on, one the on the list since you started making lists. It was one of the first ones we I, we got Fire in the Lake first, and I think this was the second coin game we we bought. Yeah, and yeah. it was the first one that we actually understood. That's right. We tried playing Fire in the Lake, got really lost. Yeah, and like, wow, I don't know what to do. Tried this one, and then kind of went back to Fire in the Lake and yeah. got more of it. Yeah, because this one is is a touch simpler. Um, more straightforward to figure out how to accomplish the goals you want to accomplish. Yep. Um, and a bit, a of bit less the simpler of the simpler coin games. My favorite one. Yeah, a bit less like active <laughs> frenemy going on within the factions. In mm-hmm. this one, you're more you've got your own goals, and it's more just that your goals don't interfere with the other person on your side. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're each kind of doing your own thing and trying to balance it out, but. Yeah, this would be the second one that I'd recommend after a distant plane if you wanted to kind of ease your way into coin. Yeah, um, I, I agree. But again, choose, assuming that we're again choose yeah. the historical one that appeals to you. I mean, the first two are simpler, are the simplest, but I actually would not recommend them. Yeah, they just weren't as compelling as the rest of yeah. the series. Yeah, I completely agree. If you want to ease into it, this is the next one to do. I think it has a lot of fun stuff. It's quirky. I mean, it's not as straightforward as a distant plane, nope. but it's quirky in simple ways. Relative to some of the other, relative to like uh, uh, Liberty or Death, which has a lot of uh, weird tangents to it. Number 44, new to the list, is Inish, the drafting game that dared to ask what happens if you have a drafting game where everyone knows what all the cards are because <laughs> there's only 12 of them i think uh and combine that with a really really tight area control thing and a brilliant rule where you have to you have to basically put people in check for a turn and say i'm winning the game here and then force them to figure out how to make you stop winning the game before the round is over. Oh, I hated our play of this at whatever convention that was. I know. I was so frustrated uh, just because of the, the the prove it thing of like, all right, I'm winning. Do you have it? And they have the one card in the entire 50 cards of the game that beats me or whatever. It's not and 50 cards. It's like 12 cards. There were more than that. There's two sets of cards. There's like the common cards oh, and right. the unique cards or whatever. Yeah, yeah. There's they, the special cards. They yeah. had the one card that could get into my area and whatever. And then there's this rule of, you know, once you move in, if either one of you chooses to fight, you have to fight. And your opponent can just keep choosing to fight and till you either die or kill their entire army, which removes one of your victory conditions. Um, and I 
realized and just was too frustrated to follow through on it that I could have tied you on the final turn, but didn't. So, yeah. whatever. <laughs> Another so, sore topic for sla- Ryan. Slash your end. I think Inish is great. I love it. Every time I've played it, I've found it absolutely fascinating. It just pulls you in. It it makes, like, advanced strategy more accessible by, again, having only a few draft cards. And by, you know, midway through your first game, you, you know what kind of actions and abilities people can have. And you know a decent amount about what, like, your neighbors have, probably. Or at least are likely to have. And then it has that guess second-guessing thing where you think you know someone has a particular card... Um, just based on the way they're playing and based on what you saw in the draft, but you're not 100% sure. I think it's a wonderful little phone booth knife fight kind of game. I think you like that a lot more than I do. I prefer to be able to build a strategy to count to account for those possibilities. Mm. And you're more willing to accept the, I don't think you have this, or I predict that you don't have this. That's uh, probably true. To be able to go for a certain win. win yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's absolutely true. It's a matter of preference in that way. Number 43, an actually new game that we have played a couple times and uh, need to play some more, Imperial Struggle. Oh, yeah, spiritual the successor. Spiritual successor to Twilight Struggle. Um, I also got the other successor to Twilight Struggle. I got to open the box in 1989, but haven't played it yet. Imperial Struggle is... Not really that similar to Twilight Struggle mechanically, but it is somewhat similar in feeling, I think. Yeah, it's got the same, like, um, victory margin tug of war thing going on, and you're, pl- you're, you're going back and forth, you know, taking turns trying to gain an advantage on the board in different in multiple regions, fronts. in multiple fronts, yeah. or different regions, and different types of actions. So, in that sense, it's similar. Uh, it's different in that I don't think you ever have to do a negative action. Um, True, it doesn't have that card-driven I war game thing going on. Um, you just you kind of have to decide where you're going to compete and predict what the your opponent's priorities will be, so that you can secure the actions you want. Yeah, um, and then you need to get a little bit lucky. But sure, yeah, I mean, it's with most games. I think it's fascinating. I've greatly enjoyed the games I've played. I but I, I feel like we barely scratched the surface. We got to really dive in. Yeah, I think this could definitely go up. I don't know if it will, but I think didn't it has we potential. have an impression that one of the sides w- had the advantage? We had that at first, and then I think we'd kind of swung the other way. Okay. I think we'd been playing a few cards wrong the first time. Okay, and I remember playing both sides and being frustrated at what you were able to do. So. I think a lot of that was just playing it for the first time or second time. Sure, yeah, yeah. But a a lot to dive into there. Imperial Struggle, definitely a fascinating game. I really enjoyed the the plates we had of it, and uh, we'll have to dive into it more. Number 42, basically staying in the same spot, Zulkin, the consistent, straightforward, not straightforward, I mean, it's all around in circles, I guess. But a yeah. uh, nice little middle midweight Euro game that continues to deliver. Loved Zulkin. Number 41, going up actually seven real spots on the list from last time, 20 net spots, uh, is Galaxy Trucker. Really? Have you even played this since I last don't, time? I think I've played it maybe once since the last it list. It's just grown in your mind? Just uh, my imagination. It grew. I don't know what happened there. But, I mean, I love Galaxy Trucker. Have you watched like I, other I media play... that makes you like this? No, I don't think so. I did play... Last time I played, which was, again, over a year ago, uh, was with the expansion, which made it tougher. Which I... was needed, because we were at the point with the base game where everyone kind of could build the ship they wanted. Yeah. And it was a matter of like who got the right tiles out of the out of the pile first, uh, to get that extra edge. But the expansion materials made it way tougher and more complex and brought back that chaos. So maybe that's what I was remembering when I was doing my rankings. But uh yeah, Galaxy Trucker, good job. Wow. Even though I haven't played it that much since More Vlada. In the last two years. Yeah, more Vlada. And uh there will still be more to come. Number 40, new to the list. Again, another one that might have just squeaked in. 
I thought it would have been on the list last time, but maybe just got it, it right must after. Have just missed, it must have just missed it. It must have been your just, game of the year. It was my game of the year in 2018, so uh, it must have just missed it. And that is Sprawlopolis. Uh, 18 cards. 18 cards. Man, it continues to deliver. The expansions have been great. The little two, three card expansions uh, oh, made really? the game tougher. Yeah. We the, played that other version of it. Agropolis, yeah, which I did not like as much. Okay. Slightly more complex, mostly the same game. I, I didn't like the art as much. I didn't like... I was hoping the combination of them, because you could combine them both yeah. into what I thought would be a mega game, but actually the combo game is barely bigger. Like the Finnish city or whatever is barely bigger than each of the individual games. Uh, so it wasn't a mega city. That made me sad. But Sprawlopolis itself is still the best game you can get that's only 18 cards. That's not really even close. Yep. Everyone should own this game and just throw it in your to-go bag. Yeah, good if you're if you're Christmas shopping. It's like yep. the definition of a perfect stocking stuffer. Yep. It's what, 15 bucks, I think? It's 10, 15, something yeah, like that. Brilliant yeah, brilliant game. Number 39, back to 18xx games. This is 1846. The OG. The first us. one I played, yeah. Which uh, I thought was brilliant the first time I played it. Taught it to some people. Some games that didn't go off quite as well just because the people we played it with didn't quite like it. And then went yeah. back and uh, played it with experienced people. And I was like, oh yeah, now I remember why I love this game so much. I really want to play it with experienced people again. Because I've taught it to people like three or four times in a row. And it just drags on for so long. And it yeah. just everyone loses interest. And it's not... It doesn't... It's not... It's not the experience it should be. I think I think I need to, when I teach the game in the future, I think I need to let people know that there's a lot of stuff in the game, like counting your routes, that isn't part of the strategy. Like, they don't need to, like, figure that out on their own. We'll just count it for them and move on. <laughs> like, there's certain mm -hmm. parts of the game that take time. And I think a, the experience a lot of new people have is they don't know what to pay attention like they don't know what to concentrate on they don't know what the important decisions are and so everything seems important and big and some of the things it's just like no we're just accounting like we're just doing upkeep basically uh so let me count up your route there's a lot of arithmetic in the yeah. xx um because 1846 is really it's about making the initial uh draft work for you and then it's about not getting yourself locked out of the end game it's about securing the right tokens. Yeah. It's about securing the right that's, spaces. That's the biggest point of contention in this game. And having enough momentum based on a good draft and a good start to make that happen easily. And yep. then the rest is just like, try not to get locked out. <laughs> and then you calculate the end. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to explain. It's 18xx has such a weird cadence compared to other games. We've done a whole podcast on this. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, but that's 1846. Number 38 on my list, also new to the list, and a new game, Pax Transhumanity. Boo. Which Orion did not like. A lot of games on this on this installment you do not like. This is probably the most games that we disagree on of a list like this in a while. Oh, just wait till the next one, Orion. All right. I don't know if you peeked ahead, but... I, I'm trying not oh to. Oh, boy. Uh, but yeah, Pax Transhumanity is an obtuse game. It's it's hard to get your mind around, but it has some really interesting, not not semi cooperative, but very interesting shared, not even quite shared incentive, but like shared disincentive <laughs> uh, stuff where the game is kind of pushing you to either jump on the bandwagon or figure out how to play spoiler uh, to like the the progress that humanity, like the, the direction humanity is taking and the type of progress humanity is taking. Uh, it, it tells these really fascinating sci-fi stories with, with technological development and a game that is more, more than just like, Oh, this is fun to play. Like, like Sprawlplus, just fun to play or galaxy trucker, just fun to play. Pax Transhumanity is a fascinating game. And that's why it ranks so highly for me. And that means, you know, maybe if I find that there are certain aspects of the gameplay that don't hold up over the over time, maybe it'll fall down. But uh, right now, it's caught my attention quite a bit. Number 37, Orion's favorite oh game on Earth, uh -oh. Stevenson's Rocket. Ah, oh, this is the worst game on this list. <laughs> 
This is the worst game on this list. I'm shocked that this is in your top 40. I know you like this game, but ugh. Ugh. Oh, it's what so a, good. What a terrible play experience. Oh, Reiner Knizia can do so many things with so little, so few mechanisms, so much. Oh, it, it's it's a it's a game about tempo, and it's about figuring out how, how to manipulate the tempo. It's it's almost a game about was it Zugzwing? That's the chess term where any move loses. Yeah, yeah, and it's a game where you're trying to force your opponents into a position where no matter what they do, it plays into your hands. And I love it. I love it so much. It's such a simple game to teach, and it's got all this little minute tempo zugzwing juicy goodness in it. And Orion is sitting here looking pained. Oh, <laughs> this was such a bland, frustrating play experience because nothing you did mattered, and there were just all these little ways of just forcing someone to spend more money than they needed to for something, and it didn't help you, it just taxed them. And then, at the end, it matters who... And the stupid train merging! Like, you merge a train into someone and you just take over the whole thing, and then if you had more shares, you just own the entire board and you win the game. So it it comes down to who owns shares in the last company, and everything else is dwarfed by that. Not that nothing else matters, but everything else in the game is dwarfed by that, and it was extremely frustrating to play. And it there's a lot of games where it's like this tough decision of like, I have two actions and there's five things I want to do, and in this game, I only have two actions and there's five things I want to do, but none of them are good. It's just like, which one doesn't help Mark or, you know, doesn't help Bubba or whatever. And just none of them are good. It's just bad. I, I could not disagree more. It's, oh, it's like when you get to that point where you have no good options, you can just look back on all the decisions you made. and You're like, ah, there, that's the hasty decision I made that put me in this weird position where, my opponent could move my train forward or the company I own forward in this way I didn't want that I couldn't afford. And it, 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 it slid into this, this uh, position I couldn't overcome. It's very, I mean, it's, it has trains, but I find it very similar to like an abstract game in that way, where you can look back on all your previous decisions and, and figure out the, the critical move. Um, I've had that experience in other games, especially 18x games or abstract games, um, you know, like chess or go like when we were playing go, I'd be like, oh, yep, that was the mistake right there. That mm -hmm. stone needed to be somewhere else um, or chess. I'd be like, oh, especially when I go back and do analysis. Well, that was a blunder and that's where I lost the game, you know, or 18x. I'd be like, yep, I I went this direction and I needed to go that direction and I lost because of that. But this game, it was just like we were losing for an hour and a half and then it ended up that Mark won by 30 points or something. I don't know if I'll, I think you, I think you would enjoy it if you played it again, but I don't think I can get you to play it again. <laughs> Anyways, it's possible that after multiple plays, I would see the sort of different tier of thinking that you're talking about and the sort of forcing moves into Zugzwang positions and manipulating that. But I just have no desire to ever touch this game again. Fair enough. But you should listen to me. 37th best game of all time. Number 36, a stalwart on my list. Game that's been around, I think it was maybe in the first installment, maybe in the top 10 or close to the top 10. It's moved kind of down in predictable fashion as new games, new exciting games have come up, but we just played it a couple months ago, actually. It was quite fun. Battlestar Galactica at number 36. Still a great game, sadly out of print. Yep. It's probably the game that's most valuable in my collection since it is out of print. Uh, I could probably sell it for a good amount of money, but I'll keep it around uh, because it is that fun. Really fun. Yeah, Especially just... once you get the right combination of expansion material. Yeah, we just played the other weekend, or a couple weeks ago, and uh, I think we've kind of narrowed in on the good chunks of each expansion, for the most part. Yeah, and we actually played for material from all three expansions, but nothing 
and, and it's all modular. It's meant to be that way, but nothing from any one expansion. Like there's there's no one entire expansion we play. We we just pick and choose, and we found our little mix yep. uh, with a couple little options we can trigger on on or off uh, that makes the game really fun. Number thirty five, new to the list, Pax Pamir Second Edition. This game is the superior PAX game for sure. Well, I agree. It's it's four three higher on my list. Okay. This it game is, is three better. This game is more like thirty <laughs> spots better than the other PAX game on this list. <laughs> At least. At least. Um PAX Premier uh first of all is a beautifully produced game. Cole Worley and his brother, whose name I don't remember, did a brilliant job making this a unique looking High quality production with the kind of canvasy cloth board yep. game cloth mat. mat. Uh, I I I bought in for the metal coins, which are maybe my favorite There's metal kind board of like game these coins. Chalky ceramic pieces that have yeah, weights the ceramic. Uh, it's really good, and yeah. the game is so fascinating. So so much depth of figuring out the like the multi step process to doing things to make your situation better yeah, personally boy. while also managing like the global, not global, I guess the countrywide situation on the board. Yeah. I Talk feel like it. I barely scratched, I barely scratched like figuring out how to play this game decently. Yeah. Uh, even though I played a few times. Talk about an opaque and roundabout strategy game of, you cannot go from point A to point B. You have to go from A to B to C to D to E to get to your destination. Yeah, but even then, like when you're just figuring out it, it still is oh, it, pleasant to play. It is. It's I a mean, lot a of large fun. part of that is the production, I think. The production is so good. It's so interesting yeah. to look at. Um, it's not really my style of art that I would choose, but I do appreciate it for mm-hmm. what it is. Yeah. Um, Pax Premier 2nd Edition really really good stuff and i know the next game that uh so whirly gig studios or whatever they call it is cole whirly's production company yeah because the, they're pa- producing a bunch of these pax games series well games, no, no, right? no they're so pax the pax series of games is from the guy whose name i can't remember sierra madre games is their company so Pax Pamir was Cole Worley's like entry into that system, and the first edition was published with Sierra Madre. Okay. Then he got owners full ownership, I guess, or production rights or whatever they did to so he could publish it the second edition himself, mm-hmm. and that's what launched his publishing company. Um, but in Cole Worley, obviously uh, much better known now for Root, uh, which is he did not oh, publish right. okay. so Leader Games or Later Games. I think it's Leader. Leader Games published. But the next game that Whirly Gig is going to publish, which presumably will be as high quality as Pax Premier, um, is the second edition of John Company, which is oh, also sweet. Cole's game that was initially published by I don't remember who. Someone a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, actually, it's not as old as I think. I th- no, it's not old. I, I imagine it as being like a 13-year-old game, and it's like a 5-year-old game or something. If that. I was very surprised at how recent it was. It it's like out. 2017 or 2016. Really? Okay. Yeah. But yeah, he's doing a new edition of John Company, which nice. I, I played the first edition once. I found it very interesting, um, and I can't wait to see what a second edition brings, that extra little level of polish, maybe some rules updates. Um, I will definitely be keeping my eyes on that, because, I mean... Sp- Spoilers, I suppose. I don't love Root. In fact, I think Root's pretty mediocre. Pax Pamir, on the other hand, I think is a very, very good design. Also, I'd like to shout out uh, Space Biff, Dan Thoreau, wrote, maybe my favorite piece of board game criticism ever, uh, comparing Pax Pamir first and second editions and showing how the changes and the gameplay mechanisms actually altered their argument about the history of that period. And so really? he looks into the games as historical documents and historical arguments um, and hmm. compares them. And it's a brilliant piece of writing. Everyone should look this up. Even if you haven't played the games, you can still understand it. And it's like a perfect example of where board game criticism can go. It's, it's absolutely astonishing. Really good work. 
All right, we're to the last game on today's installment number 34. The last one before the top third of my top 100. Number 34, it's been on the list a while, basically in the same spot as it was. Pulsar, 2849. Yeah, Back solid, to a, solid away, fr- away from games that, that I appreciate more than I enjoy. Back to one of those games that's just fun. Yep. It's just enjoyable. Just fly around space, build your pulsars, build your stations. Do stuff, get points, fiddle with your things, draft fly around. Dice, spend them and do stuff. Interact with the best dice drafting mechanism I've ever seen. Yep. Uh, you got your little player board with little upgrade tracks. Those are fun to do. Trigger or you as can many bonus them. actions as you can figure yeah. out. Go for certain goals. It's a point salad. If you hate point salads, then you won't like this game. But uh, it's one of my favorite point salad games. Yep. It's uh, it's just fun. And there we go. Top 100 list up to 34 now. Next one's going to the top games. We still have a handful of new ones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 new games to the list in the Straight top 33. Straight to the top 33. That's what we call quality. <laughs> what, instead of doing like... Instead of shrinking it and doing a dramatic top 10? No, no. I mean like climbing the list. Like they just jump straight to the top. These, these eight Oh, new yeah. Games. Oh, the games. Yeah. I mean, some of them we've got some new games. Uh, we've got some old classics and everything in between. Yep. There we go. Yeah, they'll be good. But uh, this list had a lot of contention with you. <laughs> a couple of games that you do not like. I find that interesting. Yeah. Um, our taste. I think our, I think we're defining our tastes over the years. Like, we enjoy a lot of the same games. Oh, yeah. Like, the level of overlap is severe. I mean, But I think there are these little aspects where our taste has differentiated itself in some particular games where it's very evident. Yeah, I think I've also moved towards more strategy, more strategic games with less fuzziness. Sure. And I find that I am less in the mood to play those sorts of Yoni games or finding value in predicting someone else's threshold for something Mm -hmm. um, or kind of the fuzzy conflict between multiplayers than you do. And, so you're turning yeah. basically into the opposite of Amber. <laughs> right. She th- she thrives on chaos and conflict, and I strive on having an airtight plan that no one can crack. There you go. And uh, I dabble in a little bit of everything, it seems. I've not found many things that I just absolutely hate, mm-hmm. uh, except for Root. <laughs> I don't hate Root. It's, it's, it's perfectly mediocre. I gotta I, do my review of Root at some point, where I lay it all out. I think surprises for me, probably Inish, Stevenson's Rocket, Seven Wonders Duel, I was surprised at how high those were. I was surprised London was the highest high-rising game of the whole list. I mean, I certainly like it. I'm just surprised that that is the game that jumped, in your opinion, the most over the last two years. Well, tied. Tied for the most. Okay, tied for the most. Last one, uh, Three Kingdoms Redux, went effectively up 31 spots okay sure net 31 down eight uh overall just because more games jumped ahead of it because yeah. more game, more new games jumped ahead of it and, and that then there's another s- one on next week's list that another went, high riser it went up 29 total spots wow not even net just total spots it's intense yeah so I feel like we hit kind of hit most of the party games in this this one. Yeah, Although there were a couple down below. I think what do we hit? We hit. Um, I know in terms of party games, we last time we had, we had sushi go party, stay cool, goat and goat. Yeah, this time I feel like we hit three or four of the ones that are in the rotation for us. Yeah, a um, couple eighteen XX games that I like. I've played others that I think i prefer uh at this point but i don't know that you've played those oh yeah that's a good question what is your favorite 18xx right now is it 17 probably 17 or 62 i think those are like my top two okay um i know you really like 62 i i really enjoy 17 and 18 usa which is a variant on 17 essentially it's a 17 rules with extra setup stuff and extra privacy is is 17 the one with short selling yes okay i gotta play that some point 
You do. Um, Because that kind of financial stuff would be fascinating. I think they're building it on 18xx games right now. Okay. I think that's the next one they're doing. They did just... Well, they had 46 in alpha and then beta. I think it's stable now, so we need to play that online. Yeah, I would love to get Um, some people and play 46 online. I know Ben and Jeff said they were interested, so we should make that happen. Yeah, let's do it. The Gallerist... Where does that rank among your Vital games? That is the second one so far, I believe. I believe, yes, CO2 was on last the list last time at number okay. 85 and they're definitely Lacerda games above the Galaris. I think I probably would have put that lower overall. I just I've said this before but as I've played it more that's gone down in my estimation relative to the other Vital games. Mm-hmm. Um and I just find I enjoy it less. I don't I know. I think a great variety of games on this one. Yeah, yeah, you've got You got everything from Go to Catch the Moon to you got MTG, you've got Tzulkin in there, Zulkin, you've got 18XX. 18XX games, um, War Games, and some Imperial Struggle, two PAX games. Yep. Great variety on this list. Yeah, yeah. that's where it all fits. All these games, I think, uh, more than the last list. Like, last list is a lot of, like, yeah, really fun games. These are more the gamut from, like, best of the type of games that I don't like a party like I'm not I wouldn't call myself a party gamer right but I got some of my favorite party games in like Pictomania and Catch the Moon sure um and then I I don't like small two player games aren't necessarily my thing either but we've got like Seven Wonders Dual Battle Line Fog of Love Innovation as like the almost the cream of the crop of that genre so we have really high high ranking games in styles I don't necessarily love and a lot of games on here that I find it like intellectually interesting uh, over just like like I said with Pulsar just games that are just really fun to play yeah and straightforward and there's not a lot of surprises but they're they're very well designed and enjoyable uh, but a lot of these games like Imperial struggle the Pax games um, inish uh 1822CA games that I find just interesting. Like, they're different and unique and interesting, and I want to spend time in their design world because I find it fascinating. So, that's that's how I saw the list. We'll see next time what the top games are. A lot of the same ones we saw last time, because my tastes, I mean, I, my tastes don't change radically, but... I mean, um, your top 10 games last movement. time will still be in the top, you know, 20 or 30. At Probably, least. yeah, for sure. But we'll see what happens next time. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast. Wherever you get podcasts, check out the thoughtfulgamer.com and hit me up on social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you'd like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer where you can support us and get access to live streams of the podcast to get all this information before everyone else. Yeah, and join our Discord and discuss all this, you know. Oh, yeah, precisely. In yeah. the digital world where we connect nowadays. Oh, yeah, which we're, we're doing all of our connections nowadays. Yeah, we can do that. So, again, patreon.com slash thoughtful gamer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Peace out.